I just hear the Father saying, as I had prepared for today, and he's just, he's just saying there's two things that's going to take place this morning. I'm going to trust him, and, and he's going to speak a word to you. But the thing, so that's my part. I'm going to listen to Holy Spirit and do my best not just to just go through the notes, right? But also it's for you. Whatever word that he is going to speak to you, he's wanting you to take hold of that and do something with it. Yeah. It's not just a, maybe you're going to write notes, you're just going to hear, oh, maybe that was good, maybe it was horrible. Who is this guy? But <laughs> Hopefully not. But I know that God's got a word for you this morning, and he wants you to take hold of that word and do something with that. Amen? Amen. Hey, if you got your Bibles, let's turn into the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Yeah! We are excited for the word of the Lord this morning. In this topic, I'll tell you, I've, I went back and forth on this topic because I just really felt like when pastor asked me to preach a couple weeks ago, I really just felt like, oh, I'm, there's this word that's been just stirring in my heart, and I really want to preach that word, and, and he kept talking about his covenant. He's talking about his covenant. He's bringing that to my attention and bringing that to mind. I'm like, yeah, but Father, I, just, I think maybe we're going this way. Like, no, we're going this way. And so this is a word that we're not really familiar with, is it? Maybe if you're in church, you'll hear it, or maybe if you're at a wearing, wedding sorry, ceremony, you'll hear it, right? But we're not, we're not familiar with this word. We think of, if you think of a covenant, you think of maybe an agreement that you have or a promise that you have. For me as a kid, uh, kind of the, the, as far as like having a promise or a word, if you're going to do something, you're going to do it. You tell me you're going to do something, you're going to do it. Me, me and my friends were pr playing in the front yard of a friend's house, and there was a big old tr oak tree in the corner of the property, and there was some poison ivy around it. And they were like, oh, man, stay away from that stuff. You don't want to get poison ivy. And so mom and dad, they always took us fishing when we were kids. And after dad would get off work, we'd walk down to the little Wabash River or sometimes we'd get on the sandbar or the big Wabash River, fish for catfish. Anybody ever got to do something like that? That's just a good time just to get to do that. There's some good memories there. But I had waded through poison ivy several times and I'd never gotten it. So my friend, I told my friends, no, nah, that's fine. I can get it. And he goes, I'll bet you $50 if you rub it on your face, you'll get it. Sure, easy money for me. I just scrubbed. I did. I just really, I just scrubbed. And they were just like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? Are you stupid? And uh, you know what? I didn't get poison ivy. And I've yet to see that $50. <laughs> I mean, that's been about 40 years ago, and I still haven't received that $40. But, I mean, we make agreements all the time, right? Sometimes you have a handshake agreement with somebody. You sell something. You expect them to pay you. You go ahead and let them take it or or uh, if you buy, buy a car, you know, if you buy a new car, you're going to borrow the money to buy that car. You're going to go in, you're going to make a deal, right? You're going to sit in the finance office and you're going to sign, it seems like a hundred papers, like you're signing your life away. You're making an agreement, right? And that's kind of how we start to give this context of what, what maybe a covenant or an agreement or a promise is. But man, how does it feel when that thing's broken? I mean, if somebody makes a promise to you, well, they're going to, hey, I'll, I'll buy this off of you, I'll do this, and I promise I'll be there for you. Or uh, sometimes you're in a conversation with somebody, I know no one else but maybe me does this, and after the 50th, uh-huh, oh, yeah, sure, fine, uh-huh, okay, you're finally like, you know what, um, I need to go, but maybe we can have dinner sometime, and we'll talk about it then, right? You're, all you're wanting to do is get away from that person, <laughs> but you're just kind of making this, well, we'll talk later, okay? I just don't have time for that. And then we never follow up, Right? I mean, sure, I'm, I know, I'm the only one that does that, right? Okay, all right, fine, that's, that's fine, that's fine, Lord help me, okay. But man, it just starts to build, just like where we feel like we can't trust some agreements. And don't let me get started about politics. Oh my goodness, I promise if I'm elected, uh-huh, sure, fine, right? And it's on all sides of the fence, so we're not playing favorites there. But yeah, I mean, it just builds this, this sense of, man, I don't, I don't know that I want to get into an agreement. It hurts. What if they don't follow through? But yet, yeah, what if I don't follow through? I know me. Sometimes I, I don't have time or I'm tired of plans change and I hate to follow up with that, with that, degree, that you know, conversation later on because I just, I'm not going to have time to, to mess with that. But you see, God is a covenant God. And, and what we think of marriage even, right? The covenant in marriage because God established that. Because when you're married, it's not just you and your spouse. It's you, your spouse, and God. It's a covenant between the three of you. And what's the only thing that the Bible says can break that covenant? 
is death, right? And so God's pretty serious about covenant. Yeah. And maybe that's the only type, and some of you here have been through that, and you've have got a lot of hurt because of that. And so everything that God does is covenant. Webster's Dictionary describes a covenant as this, a formal and serious agreement or promise or a formal written agreement between two people, businesses, or countries even. But covenant's not really explained well in Scripture. And the reason for that is, is in Scripture, the Hebrew culture, which is where we get our Scriptures from, right, is, is they knew covenant. They lived in covenant. They kept coming. There's this big ceremony, and I wish I had time to go into all the details of a covenant ceremony that they did. They took covenant really serious. They took their word very serious and their agreements very serious. And in our Western culture, it's not so much. It seems almost to be somewhat okay if I, well, I understand you're busy. Or that the excuse can trump the covenant, right? We find ourselves falling into that. I've been there. And I know you've probably even been victim of that or been on both sides of that. And so God establishes covenant with his people. Why is that? Because of his love for us, he want, he got in, in a covenant means he is going to bind himself yes. to you. So there are nine covenants in the Bible, We're gonna, and there, there are seven big covenants. The first one you may be familiar with is the Noahic covenant. So we know that when God, remember Noah and the ark, when God flooded the earth because of the sin that was just running rampant on the earth, but he found one faithful man. He found Noah to be faithful, and he's going to start over with Noah, and so as the floodwaters receded and they came out of the ark, God made covenant with Noah. He made covenant that he would never again flood the earth, and he put his rainbow up, up in the sky as a sign of that covenant. And then we have the Abrahamic covenant. Ever, ever, anybody seen Father Abraham had many sons when you were a kid? You know, I don't even know if they still do that, Blake, or not, but, but the, you know, it's a song that we sang, and, and because through Abraham, the whole world's going to be blessed. Through him, he is going to, God is making a nation for himself, and he is going to be their God. And then we, the one we're pretty familiar with is the Mosaic Covenant. That's your Ten Commandments. That's where, as, as the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, and God is, is establishing a covenant with his people, he rescues them from the hand of Pharaoh and from bondage and slavery, and he's going to take them and make them a people again and establish a land with them. And so he, he drafts up the Ten Commandments. Hey, and, and it's, it's like, if you guys will do this, I'm going to do that. Because, the in covenant, there are two types of covenant. The first type of covenant is a conditional covenant. Yeah. That means if you do this, then I'm going to do that. Just like when you buy the car. If you make these monthly payments, then you can have the car now. Okay? Now, let me tell you, car prices are out of control, aren't they? <laughs> is that just me? That's crazy. Spend been $1,000 a month on a car payment. Whew. I don't recommend that. Pay cash. All right, enough of that. No Dave Ramsey speeches today. All right. <laughs> it's better for you. <laughs> but yeah, it's, so that's a conditional covenant. The Ten Commandments were a conditional covenant. And the other covenant is an unconditional covenant. That's where if I say I will regardless of what you do. So in marriage, like when, with Amy and I, if we're in covenant marriage together, and if I say something stupid, which, you know, I rarely do, right, okay, <laughs> then she's not going to break our covenant because I said that. Now, I might break, if we get into an argument, I might break fellowship with her. I mean, am I the only one that does that? You know, if, I, if, if me and Amy, like, especially if she's driving, which, it's kind of funny, the older I get, the more I like to let her drive. I don't know what that is, but, <laughs> and so, like, we'll have an argument, or like a disagreement about something, and does anybody, I'll just turn out and look out the window. So I'm out of fellowship with her. I'm not out of covenant with her. She's still my bride, but we get out of fellowship. And somebody needs to hear that today. Maybe you were walking with Jesus, and all of a sudden you, you, you did something silly. You sinned. You messed up. And you think, well, that's it. I tried the God thing. I, I can't do it. I just can't. He knows that. He knows we can't do it. That's why he established a covenant for us. And then he's, his arms are open. The yeah. door's open. Come back. Yeah. Yeah. Just come back. I'm so glad that my wife doesn't send me to the doghouse. I get to come back. <laughs> We're in covenant. 
Covenant is a good thing. Everything God does is through covenant. And aren't you glad that he loves us through covenant? All right. And so we have this Mosaic covenant. Then we have the priestly covenant. That's where the priests do the sacrifices. The bloody, it's a bloody mess. And they sprinkle the blood on the, ark, the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant to atone for the sin because we can't keep the Ten Commandments, right? What did Jesus even say? Jesus said that if you have hatred in your heart for somebody, you've committed murder. Well, check, blew that commandment. For guys, if we look at a woman with lust in our hearts, we committed adultery. Well, blew that one. Now what? We're in trouble, right? So annually, the priests would take that blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat to atone for the sin because life is in the blood. And he, he atoned, so the, our sins are, were atoned for then. And so there had to be a better way. There just had to be a better way. And from the, I love God so much because from the moment of the fall in the garden, he started pursuing us. He started working on a plan. And, and so back in, so we're in Jeremiah 31. All right, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that made that I made, sorry, with their fathers. See, he's talking about that old covenant that day. <clears throat> I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will be remembered no more. How incredible is that? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. He has made covenant. And so he, so way before Jesus is even on the scene, God's saying, hey, there's going to be a new covenant. They can't keep my old covenant, but there's a new one coming. And even in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, I'll have it up here for you. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take that heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So through Jesus, we have this new covenant. It's better. And it is an unconditional covenant because God and Jesus, I just picture this in heaven when this is taking place. God looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you'll go, if you'll be born of woman, and if you will go and live like I know how you're going to live, you're going to live without sin, and you'll go to the cross, you can save mankind. How awesome is that? They made a covenant together because if he made it with me, I'd have broke it. We would have break it, wouldn't we? We can't, we can't keep that covenant. And it's almost, I say this, it's almost scandalous to me because Jesus did all the heavy lifting. Jesus, I mean, he died for me. I didn't have to die. All I have to do is say yes. I have to agree with God about my sin and say, you know what, God, you're right. I'm a sinner. Without you, I'm lost. I need you. And I give you my yes. You can have my life. I wasn't doing good things with it anyway. You can have it, right? Yeah, that is, and that's the new covenant that we have. And Jesus, before he goes to the cross, even prophesies about the new covenant in Luke 22, 19 and 20. It says he took the bread, he gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in, in remembrance with me, which is also a part of our covenant that we have for him. That his broken body heals our bodies. Isn't that incredible? Man, there's just more good stuff we get through this covenant. And then verse 20 says, Likewise, he also took the cup of after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. Wow. So again, when we sin, we, we're not breaking covenant. We're breaking fellowship. And Jesus is giving us an opportunity to come back. The open door, it's an open invitation. Amen. All right. If you would turn to Joshua, it is back a few chapters right after Leviticus. And for some reason, in first service, I didn't know where Joshua was. <laughs> you get up here and you're just like, oh, is it in the New Testament? No, I don't think so. It's back here. 
Help me, Jesus. All right. So we're going to look at Joshua chapter 9. And this story is interesting. So Moses, so to kind of build up to this part, Moses is, is not able to enter into the promised land. Moses has died. And now Joshua is leading the Israelites, leading them into the promised land. And as they follow the Lord, they're quite successful. That Holy Spirit is, is just going forth and leading them, and they are victorious. And so, verse 1 in chapter 9, let me flip back there. All right. And it came to pass when all the kings who were on the side of the Jordan and the hills of the lowland and all of the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzites, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard about it. So you have all these ites. And they gathered together to fight against Joshua Israel one accord. But the inhabitants of Gideon heard what Joshua had done at Jericho and Ai. They worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. What's this about? And they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, and old patched sandals for their feet and old garments on, them, on themselves. And the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. Doesn't that sound yummy? And they went to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal and said to him, We have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make covenant with us. There's that word again. Make a covenant with us, Joshua. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell among us. So how can we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you and where do you come from? So they said to him, From a very far away country. Your servants come. And so that's not true, is it? What, what are these guys trying to pull here? They're trying to save their own skin, aren't they? And so, the, so they, they get this, this big ruse up and they get the moldy bread and, the, and all this. And it goes on in the scripture to say that the Israelites took and look, looked at the bread and they, they saw that it was moldy. Well, sure, they, looked, they checked them out, their clothes, their camels and stuff, and their donkeys. And like, yeah, you guys, man, you, how long did it all take y'all to get here? Must have been a long time. So let me see a verse. So verse 16. So yeah, the ruse is up. So in verse 16, they go and they find out, okay, you guys are full of it. You're, only, you're our neighbors. You only live three days away from us. But they did not inquire of the Lord. Let me just encourage you. If you're going to come into an agreement with somebody... You better inquire of the Lord. If there's something that you believe that you need to be about, you need to be doing, you need to inquire of the Lord, amen. They didn't do it. But why are we talking about this? Because if God is a God of covenant, let me tell you something, he's going to keep his covenant. So Israel agreed to keep a covenant with the Gibeonites. And what happens? Well, they find out they were lying to them. They only lived three days away. They're only in it to save their own skin. And so Israel's angry, and Israel is ready, like, oh, let's, let's, come on, Joshua, let's give it to them, man. They, they tried to mess us over, they lied to us, this isn't going to work out. And the leaders of Israel said, guys, hold on, we made a covenant with them, and we swore by the name of the Lord in this covenant. And if we go and we fight against the Gibeonites, then, then that wrath of God is going to come on us, so we're going to do it. And so even though it was foolish, God still upholds his covenant. And it gets worse, too, folks, because the surrounding cities were like, traitors, Gibeonites, you made buddies with Israel? You made a covenant with them? We're coming after you. So what happens? Gideon's like, not, the Gibeonites are like, hey, Israel, um, we need some help. Oh, remember, we're in covenant. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. And so Israel had to come and fight. Israel had to protect the Gibeonites because God watches over his covenant. God's not like us. Yes. Well, I had something else going on. Well, I didn't feel like it that day. I am so glad that my faith and walk with Jesus is not based on my feelings. Because I'm telling you, some days I'm on the mountaintops, and some days I'm wondering, where God, God, where are you at? Don't you know what's going on? Where are you? And he promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. But he's right there. Call upon him. He's right there beside you. If you walk away from him, call upon him. He's still there. He's not left you. His arms are open wide. God keeps his covenant. He, watched over, he watches over his covenant. I'm so thankful that he does so, aren't you? Amen. Covenant. Man, that's just a, 
different term. It's something we're not really used to, but there's a reason we need to understand covenant, just as the Hebrews did. There's so much in the covenant, and we're going to talk about one part in there, and I wish I had time to go through all of it because it's amazing. We need to know where we stand with God. We need to know as sons and daughters who we are and what this covenant is and what it means so that we can live how he wants us to live. And I'm telling you, don't you feel a shift? Don't you see what's going on? I love it. I don't want to go back to the way we were. I don't. That wasn't God's intention for us as a nation and as a people because we're light in the darkness. He wants us to move forward. There is a shift taking place in the church. And I'm so thankful for a pastor who has a spine that will stand up and say, guess what? It's not about church attendance anymore. It's not about numbers. It's about Jesus. Come on. It's about his presence. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that the shift is taking place. It's scary, right? I'm the kind of guy that wants to know what's going on. God, can you let me in? Can you tell me what's going on? When Amy and I first met, and she, she's really helped me get rid of this, and I don't even know why I'm going here, but I, we would go for a two-day trip. Like, I remember we went canoeing on the Current River with her mom and dad when we had been dating maybe a couple of weeks. I pack this big suitcase to go on a two-day trip. And they, they were looking at me like, are you moving out of your house? What do you do? I, like, I, I, I was prepared for everything, every situation. I had like four or five sets of clothes, different swim trunks. I mean, what if we get, well, if the canoe tips over, I'm going to need to do this, extra this. And I probably had a spare toothbrush. I don't know, but I, that's just how I, I'm, I'm wired. I'm like, I got to know. God, can you just let me know? Just, just, just kind of let me know, God. I'm just, let's trust him. Who he's put, put us in a position to trust. If we give him our yes, let's try and not take it back. If we're going to be in covenant, why don't we just keep our word to the Lord, right? And it's okay. But God, what if this happens? What if that happens? Hey, stay in his hands. Stay in his arms. It's going to be all right. So he watches over his covenant. He keeps his covenant. And it's important. So if, if we serve a covenant God and we know that he's not going to go back on his word and he's not going to back out of the covenant like we might do, what's in the covenant? Again, there's a lot. A lot, and I really wish I had time, but I don't have time to, to go into all that. But there's one that's really big that we're going to go over this morning. And so, does anybody remember David and Jonathan? Yeah. King David yeah. and Jonathan, who was Saul, King Saul at the time. You know, David's getting ready, going to end up succeeding Saul as king. And, but King Saul had a son named Jonathan, and him and David were best friends. I mean, these guys would fight for each other. They would give anything for each other. And so... 1 Samuel, and I'll just read this for you here, 18, 1 through 5, it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the son of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took, look at this, you really need to pay attention to what takes place here. Verse 4, And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. If you're taking notes on that, you're going to want to at least bookmark that verse because every part of that is significant. In verse 5, it says, So David went out when, wherever Saul sent him. He behaved wisely, and Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. So when in covenant with the Lord, in this new covenant that God has made for us through Jesus. We have an exchange made, and the robe is significant. So when Jesus went to the cross, what took place in that day was he reached to us, and he took our robe of sin and shame, and he put it upon himself to be nailed to the cross, and he takes off his royal robe, and he put it on you. Is that not incredible? We have a great exchange and a new identity in Christ. Just like these awesome baptisms. Man, those were awesome. I love watching people get baptized. They are made new and whole in Jesus. They have a new, a new robe. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for who? Us. 
that we might, you got to get this in your spirit today, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. How good is that? Do you sit, ever think that, you know what? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. We don't say that over ourselves. But we need to because that's our new identity. Those who love Jesus and have given their heart to them, that is your identity. You are the righteousness in Christ. Why is that important? Because here's the thing. In our Western culture, we just, it's like if I get saved and I can hang on and maybe live a good life, I'll go to church, I'll read my Bible when I can, I'll pray, I'll do all those churchy Christian things, and then I'm going to go, get to, he go, be, go to heaven and be with Jesus. It's time for a mind shift here because the thing about it is you're not saved for you. You're saved for the person seated next to you. You're saved for those that you work with. You're saved for your family. You're saved for everyone that God is going to put you in contact with. Wow, that blew my mind when Holy Spirit told me that. Blew me away. I'm like, really? Now, yes, you're saved. You know, and when you pass away... As a born-again believer, you're going to get to be with the Father in heaven, and that's so good and that's so vitally important. But the, then why not, if that was really just the case, then why not we just get poofed right up into heaven when that took place? I get saved, boom, all right, there's another one, boom, boom. And all of a sudden you see just people vaporized everywhere. What's going on? I know in this house it'd be empty. I'd be speaking to a bunch, bunch of empty seats. Yeah, we're saved for those around us. That's so important because now, because of the robe exchanged at the cross, when God looks at you, he sees his son so that when everyone else looks at you, they see Jesus. There's a lot of awesome folks in here, and I don't have enough time today just to go over each and every one. I love being with you. I love when pastor said, hey, buddy, I need you to speak on the 20th. I'm like, oh, good, because I get to be with so many people I love so much, and they look like Jesus. I look around this room. I see so many people that look like Jesus. And I love being around people that look like Jesus. And when you're in your workplace and you're going and you see a coworker going through stuff and they've got to look at your life and they're like, man, you know, how do you do that? How, how do you go through your daughter being completely rebellious, running headlong into the world, and yet you still praise God and you're still reading your Bible? How do you do that? And then there you go. You just get to slide right in. Holy Spirit already did the work. Say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you that no matter where you've been or what you've done or what you've gone through, let me tell you, just as Blake had proclaimed from this stage this morning, that there's no devil anywhere that can take away what God wants to do in our life. There's no devil bigger than Jesus anywhere. Jesus is king. Amen. He is king over all. That's right. So I'm so thankful. That when God made that exchange, now we get to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when people look at us, they see him, not me. They don't need to see me, I'm telling you. And so the Greek word for become is geonomai. It says to come into existence, to come into existence, come to pass, to, as in the being made the righteousness. So that took place. That exchange happened. We are now the righteousness of God and Jesus. And so one of my favorite parables in the New Testament is the prodigal son. I love that story. I myself had had a prodigal, and I can testify that you stand firm, you hold on, you trust God, and you don't give up. If they've got breath in their lungs, you don't. Mom and dad, hear me. Grandma and grandpa, hear me. Maybe it's a spouse. You don't give up because God watches over his word and he watches over his covenant. And they'll come back. They'll come back. And so what I love about this story, and it's in Luke 15, 11 through 32. We're not gonna, we don't have time to read all of it, but the father sees the son a long way off. And if you know this story, it's the son went up to dad one day, and it must have, obviously he was wealthy, and he's like, hey, dad. I'm, I'd like my inheritance, please. Now, I would have never asked my dad something like that. I'd have got knocked upside my head if I was, hey, dad, give me my inheritance. I'm going to go party, you know. <laughs> Boy, get out of here, right? But no, dad does it. He, all right, son, gives him his inheritance. He, we know that he ran off to a foreign country and just blew it, didn't he? I mean, just 
blew it, and it wasn't on good stuff. He wasn't making good investments, let's just put it that way, okay? Well, he finds himself poor, starving, and he has to hire himself out to a pig farmer. And for a Jewish young man to do that, that's a big deal. They didn't, they didn't have anything to do with pigs. They were unclean. Oh. So he's out there feeding them and caring for them. And he looks at what, what's being fed, and he, it's like he longs to eat what they're eating. He's like, and he just comes to himself, and he says, I need to go back home because my father's servants are better off than I am right now. I'm just going to go tell dad, dad, I'll, I'll, just be, I'll just be a hired servant. And so what I love is the father is looking for him. And he sees him a far way off. And see, he's trusting, isn't he? My son's going to come home. He's coming home. And so there's two things here, though, that we need to grasp. What does the father do? He runs out to him. Why is he doing that? Yes, he loves him and he misses him. But he's got to do something. What's the next thing he says? Servants, hey, guys, get the robe. Get the robe. Hurry up. Get the robe. Get the ring. Get the sandals. Get them on him right now. Because as that son walked back home, I'm sure some folks saw him. Oh, that's so-and-so's boy. You remember what he did to his daddy? And see, in the, in, you got to understand culturally what that son had done was worth, worthy of death. They were going to stone him. And so daddy runs out. Hey, hey, get the robe. Get the robe. Get it on him. He's, because the son was wearing those old filthy rags we used to wear. He was wearing that sin and shame in his head down low. And Father, if I could just be a servant now. And we have a new identity because he puts the robe on him. He says, no, this is my son. He is not full of shame. He is my beloved. And that's what God says to you. He puts that robe on you. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done or gone through. He wants to put the robe of his son upon you and clothe you. So in covenant, we have a new identity. And there's so much to that identity. Yes, it's great for us that we get to be clothed with righteousness. But there comes a responsibility with this new robe. We're not just going to sit in our seats Sunday after Sunday waiting on Jesus to return so we can just go home. If we are indeed saved for those around us, we want to live and activate and move and have our being in that. That's why there's a shift. God's not shifting things in our midst just so we can keep doing what we have been doing. He is shifting things because I'm looking at a church full. And if you're watching online, you're, you're in our campuses, I'm looking at a, just hundreds and hundreds of people that God has filled with and he has clothed and you are going to move out and you're going to be effective and God's going to do things through in and through you that it's going to blow you away. How did I not know this? It's because we don't know covenant. How did I not know that I could do these things? Because we don't know covenant. I remember when I first answered the call to, to ministry about 20 years ago. I was so excited, and man, this, I could just feel the presence of God and the things that Jesus was just doing in my life, and knowing that all the mess that I had been a part of was washed away, and I was just awesome, I was just excited, and I'm like, my family needs this, my, my whole family needs to know Jesus, and I did, I started ministering to my cousins and aunts and uncles, and, and then the Lord kept putting my dad on my heart, and I'm like, oh Lord, that's that's dad. You know, and I always passed it off as, well, Jesus even experienced it, a prophet is without honor in his own hometown, so, and they wanted to push him off a cliff, so, and I could be around dad, and I was in my mid, mid-20s or so, and I'd still feel like a 10-year-old around dad. He just had to look at me. I couldn't talk to dad about that, right? What's the two things you hardly can't talk to, to family about? Politics and religion. And of course, God was saying, I don't want you to talk about religion. I want you to talk about my son. But I was terrified. I, I can't explain it. I was that little boy all over again. And I didn't know what to do. And so I would pray for my dad. I would, I would ask God to, God, save his friends. That'll do it. I'm, I'm helping God out. We're going to be, we're going to plan this out. We'll be strategic. If you save his friends, he'll listen to them. He's not going to listen to me. And then, I just continue, God, save, save him, save him, save him. And don't we do this? Why, why do we keep asking God to do the things that Jesus told us to do? Please hear me. And so my dad gets cancer. 
And of course, I'm, huh. God, we kind of got a, a clock on this thing now. Are you going to save Dad? Or, and he's like, who are you? I didn't know my own identity. <laughs> you see, what's funny is I had this really nice checkered shirt I love to wear that I was going to preach in. And I wasn't trying to be gangster. But the cameras can't do a checkered shirt. So like, hey, production seems like, yo, you've got it here. Put this on. And it didn't, I, it didn't hit me that I got a new robe. And so I get a phone call. So I did. I started, I started being a little more bold. And I'd go so far with Dad. And I'd, I'd talk to him. And I'd had to back off a little bit. And I'd talk to him and I'd share Jesus. And his Dad got more sick, I, I, got, I, didn't, I started not caring anymore. And I'd put my arm around him. And I'd sit with him on the couch. Because he had to lay on the couch all the time. Because he's in a lot of pain. And, I put my arm around him and I kissed him on his forehead. I'd never done that before. And the Lord just started to bring, remind me of who I am, who I am as a son in my identity. And so Amy and I are in Marion, which is about two hours from where mom and dad live, and I get a phone call from mom. She's, and she just said, your dad needs you. He, he's asking for you. He needs you. And so we, we show up and my dad's in tears. And I'm still scared. I'm, I'll just be honest with you. I was still scared. I mean, this is my dad. And he looks at me and he says, Greg, how do you know that there's life after death? How do you know? And I could tell the Holy Spirit was on him. And I said, Dad, I said, surely you've seen a difference in me. You knew me ever since I was born. I hope and pray, Dad, I said, that at some point you saw a change in me. He said, I did. I remember that. I said, Dad, that was Jesus. He said, but son, he said, I've lived my whole life. I lived my whole life. How could he save me now? And I said, Dad, the thief on the cross right before his death said, Jesus, would you remember me in your kingdom? And my dad gave his heart to Jesus that night. I had prayed for 20 years. We've got to know who we are. We've been believing a lie. We are in covenant with God. We have a new robe. It's not that, that old person that we tried to identify ourselves with. Well, I'm this because I did that, or I'm this because I did that. No, you're not. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creature. You have his identity. We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can text the word NEW LIFE to the number 618-243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to give to the ministry of The Roads Church, visit our website www.theroads.church for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.